Our scripture today comes from 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verses 14 through 17. And we're going to try something today that probably we haven't done since before COVID. Uh, But we're all going to read it together. So let's start at verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have been convinced of, because you know those from what you learned, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So ends the reading of our word, the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Well, we've been looking at uh, Adam Hamilton's book, The Walk, The Five Essential Practices of the Christian Life. Last week we talked about worship and prayer uh, being uh, two essential things uh, in our Christian walk and uh, our path to discipleship. Today we're going to look at study, studying the scriptures. And um, today, I was thinking about this, and actually, um, uh, how many people ever had one of these in school? Maybe for your kids or something? My mom got this for each one of us kids for school. And in it, you know, it's got my kindergarten picture, you know, and who my teacher was and things. And then it's got a little packet. And, and, and a lot of it, it, it's got my report cards. So my second grade report card. I'm going to look at this. Me and my brother both have one of these, and we, we varied a little bit in school because school for my brother Tom was very easy. For me, I had to work in school. But I always like going back and reading the comments that the teachers wrote about you. And I love this comment. Jeffrey is doing, um, uh, doing average work. However, he is easily distracted and doesn't always complete his work on time. Now, that was kind of a common thread for me in, high, in, in school, was I was easily distracted. Sometimes I was disinterested. Sometimes I was just not attentive in class. So, you know, I look about that and I says, how easy it is for us to be distracted. You know, when we talk about distractions and, and paying attention, one of the things is we need to pay attention to hear the master's voice. The message I gave the kids was, you know, sometimes if we're perfectly quiet, what do you hear? Nothing. But even in the still quiet, we can still hear God's voice. We need to pay attention to God, pay attention to the whispers to key into what God is doing. I'm going to read a lot of scripture from Psalms because in the Psalms there's a lot of uh, where David or whoever else wrote some of the Psalms, they cried out to God for their need. They also cried thanks and and worshipped God through uh, a lot of the Psalms. But in Psalm 119, uh, verse 97, it says, I love your instruction. I think about it constantly. I mean, when do you hear God's instruction? Or maybe you haven't recognized where God is speaking to you. Some find God in nature, beautiful sunrises or sunsets, the beach, in the waves, the the mountains, the sounds of nature, the birds, the, the sounds of a gentle rain shower. Maybe some people just see mountains and oceans and hear the birds and the rain. But today, I want us to focus on the importance of paying attention. And most often it occurs when we are willing to meet God at least some of the way. And the best way is through the word as written 
in the Bible. Psalm 19 goes on and says in verse 103 to 105, Your word is so pleasing to my taste buds. It's sweeter than honey in my mouth. I'm studying your precepts. That's why I hate every false path. Your word is a lamp before my feet and a light for my journey. See, the the Bible, how many, by a show of hands, how many people have a copy of the Bible? How many people open it up at least once a week? You know, 87% of the people surveyed have a copy of a Bible, okay? But out of that same survey, it says only 32% open it up at least once a week. You know, if, if you don't have a Bible, we have some available for you to, you know, to take home and to study. You know, the Bible... If you look at it as a history, uh, it's actually a, a library of books. It's not a book in itself. It's a library of 66 books. But the Bible covers about 1,000 years, maybe a little bit more. And its last entry is about 2,000 years ago. The first book believed to be written was Amos. Uh, a, a prophet, one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament, followed by the first part of Isaiah, then Hosea and Micah. The last book that was probably most, it's probably uh, most agreed upon was Revelation, which is the last book in our Bible. But what if we went home this week and challenged yourself to open your Bible at least once a day? Maybe that's our part of meeting God, part of the way to listen at what God has to say to us. Because I believe Scripture has this unique ability and opportunity to to touch and to speak to us in various ways in whatever circumstances we may find ourselves going through. You know, someone in the Bible that gives us an example of this is Jesus, who You know, we find Jesus many times quoting parts of the Old Testament. Even Jesus read the Bible. Of course, it wasn't called the Old Testament then, you know, because there was not the New Testament yet. But Jesus quoted much from the Torah, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He quoted from the prophets of Isaiah and others. And many times, he knew them so well, he he rephrased them into the way that people could relate and understand in their context or their circumstance. Jesus did this with speaking in parables, a, a parallel of the scripture and a description from the common day situation as a way of making it or uh, make sense but also having the listener reflect how they had not lived up to what it says. You know, one of the instances that Jesus used scripture was when he was um, countering the temptation in the desert. In Matthew, the fourth chapter, verses 1 and 2, the temptation of Jesus, it says, Then the Spirit led Jesus up into the wilderness so that the devil might tempt him. And after Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was starving. The tempter came to him and said, Since you are God's son, command these stones to become bread. I mean, Jesus was hungry. Jesus was maybe weak in the temptation for food. And and I know how I get when I get hungry. But Jesus relied on the scriptures to counter that temptation. Jesus replied, it is written, people won't live only by bread, but by every word spoken by God. See, in the midst of his most challenging moment, Jesus went to scripture, to Deuteronomy. It did the same in the next where Jesus asked Jesus to, or, or asked God to uh, put God to a test by saving him if he lived leapt off the side of a mountain. Again, Jesus used scripture from the Psalms. Don't test the Lord your God. 
than when the devil told Jesus he could, have, he could rule the whole kingdom. If, if Jesus would just bow down and worship Satan, Jesus used Deuteronomy and said, Go away, Satan, because it is written, You will worship the Lord your God and serve only him. See, just as Jesus did sometimes when his life gets challenging, you feel lost when your life gets really hard, looking for help may only be a scripture away. But you won't realize that unless you're not reading and reflecting on them. There was a time, Karen and the kids and stuff, we were on a, a cruise. We went on a cruise down in the uh, Caribbean and at that time, it was something I really desperately needed a vacation. I was, I, was, uh, I was frustrated. I was frustrated with work. I worked for a big church up, up, up north. And I was frustrated and lost. And I felt like leaving the ministry and going finding a job at McDonald's. But I remember I was up on the deck of the, uh, the ship. Karen was falling off of a treadmill, and I don't know what the kids were doing. But it was one of those sea days, you know, the days at sea. And I was up on the deck, and I faced the deck chair towards the ocean, that expanse of an ocean. It was a beautiful day. A slight breeze was blowing directly at me. And it felt good, but I, I couldn't soothe what I was feeling inside. With me, I had my Bible, and I had another book by Neil Cole called Organic Leadership. I'll never forget this. And Neil is a church planner, and he's written several books on church leadership. And what I really like about Neil's books is he references a lot of things to leadership, or in the Bible, to leadership, because he feels that the best leadership is the Bible. But I had my Bible in Neil's book, and I, I was flipping back and forth. You know, I opened up the Bible, and halfway through a chapter in Neil's book, and I find, found myself opening the pages of another book I had with me, the Bible. I opened it right in the middle, and I found myself in Psalms. Psalms 25, verse 4, Make your ways known to me, Lord. Teach me your paths. I closed my eyes and I repeated and I even prayed that one verse. Make your ways known to me, Lord. Teach me your paths. And I was led to go back to that other book. As I read or began to read, I, I felt Neil's words were speaking right to me. Neil used a lot of scripture to back up what he writes. Things started to make sense. I found myself not just reading the words, but seeing myself in them. And I started to relate them to situations I was encountering, to other people that were challenging me and how to possibly deal with them. I mean, was that Neil speaking to me? I don't believe so. I firmly believe it was God speaking through Neil's printed words on the page and the scripture references he used to speak to me. Because I asked God to make his ways known for me. And through Neil's book was teaching me the path, the path out of my frustration and my hopelessness. I was lost, but now I was found. Psalm 55, verse 22 says, Cast your burdens on the Lord. He will support you. I mean, God will never let the righteous be shaken. Again, what if we went home this week and challenged ourselves to open the Bible at least once per day? Maybe that's our part in meeting God, part of the way to listening at what God has to say to each and every one of us. First chapter of Psalm, verse 2 says, Instead of doing those things, these persons love the Lord's instructions and they recite God's instructions day and night. We must keep it in front of us. You know how it is when you learn something, right? Maybe it's playing a sport or a musical instrument, typing, you name it, you know, 
You may have done it well at the very first time you did it, right? Or at least after several times doing it. But what would happen if you only did it that first time and then you didn't do it for a long time? Could you do it as well as you first once did it? You have to practice. You have to do whatever it is over and over again until it becomes natural again to you. Same goes for scripture. That verse in Psalm 119, verse 90 said, I love your instruction. I think about it constantly. To make scripture relevant, relevant to whatever is happening in your life, you have to keep it in front of you. So do you think you can go home this week and once a day open your Bible, open its pages, maybe just randomly open it to anywhere? I mean, I don't know who came up with the line of thinking that you had to start at the very beginning, Genesis, when you read it. Sometimes just opening it up anywhere randomly and, and reading a few verses can speak to you better if you start in the beginning. See, Open your Bible once a day and read, let's say, five verses. That's usually a good passage where you, you can get the context of what, is, what it's intended to say. Open it once a day this week and read five verses each day. But first, pray. Pray. Use this maybe as one of your five prayers that I talked about last week that I challenged you with. You know, when you get up, you pray. But today, we have used several verses from the Psalms. You know, reading the Psalms is a great reading plan of the Bible. There's 150 Psalms. What if we read one Psalm a day? Maybe a couple, you know, of the longer ones we can spend two or three days on. You could read through the Psalms twice in a year. You know, maybe you read Proverbs. There's 31 Proverbs, one a day for a month. You know, maybe it's a gospel. Maybe Matthew for a month, and Mark, and then next Luke, and then John. Maybe it's the letters of Paul. See, there's no right way or wrong way to read the Bible. But you have to practice it. You must keep it in front of you. I mean, there, there are too many other things that get in the way, that distract us, that keep us from listening to what God has to say to each and every one of us. You know, something I use as a way of reading the Bible is using something that in various forms has been used for the last three centuries. It's called the Lectio Divina. It's the divine reading you take a brief passage, only maybe a verse or two, and first I pray for the Holy Spirit to, to speak to me. What are you speaking about to me today? How might you inspire and inform me today? How might you encourage me today? And then I read the scripture for the first time. I, I might focus on a word or a phrase that really speaks to me because it causes me to pause. And maybe there is a flash before my eyes and I see myself in a situation or I see a person that I've encountered that week. Or I read it a second time. Maybe I read it out loud slowly to really let each word settle in. And as I say that, maybe under my breath, I said, Lord, speak to me. I'm listening. What does this mean to me? Then I use the verse as a prayer. How do you want me to do what I have read or to whom? Help me, show me, Lord. And then finally I sit silent. I contemplate what I have read in silence. I reflect on each and every word or phrase that I picked out earlier. Or maybe the whole passage. You know, several years ago, and then, then again, I read it a couple months ago, a scripture that really speaks to you differently each time you read it. And that comes from 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verses 4 through 7. It's commonly called the love chapter. And it says, love is patient, love is kind, it, it isn't jealous, 
It doesn't brag. It isn't arrogant. It isn't rude. It doesn't seek its own advantage. It isn't irritable. It doesn't keep a record of complaints. It isn't happy with injustice, but it is happy with the truth. Love puts up with all things, trust in all things, hopes for all things, endures all things. Somebody told me to substitute my name where it says love. To put my name in place of love in that passage. And wow, was that a wake-up call of when I hadn't been patient or kind or when I had been jealous Maybe I was bragging too much about my accomplishments or how I was using people or circumstances as to my own advantage. You know, a couple years ago, it was that other part of the verse that really spoke to me how I wasn't happy with injustice, but I was happy with the truth. To put up with all things, to trust in all things, and endure all things. This is a picture of Mike. Mike was someone I knew when I worked at Miss Carly's who helps with the homeless and uh, those in addiction up in uh, the Rockford area. Mike is a single dad and he has two teenage daughters. They, they live there with their respective moms in Chicago, but Mike lives in Rockford. You know, many years ago, Mike started to hang out with the wrong crowd and got a girlfriend pregnant, and then a few years later, another girlfriend pregnant. And Mike scratched and clawed and tried to support his daughters and then his girlfriends at the time. But things always seemed to go awry, and Mike would go out and party and get drunk, and he would lose his job and maybe get kicked out and live on the streets. It wasn't too long that he was prohibited from seeing his daughter because his mom didn't want anything to do with Mike. And Mike soon, soon found himself supporting himself with a life of crime. Robbing stores and stealing cars and he ended up in prison. And each time Mike was released he vowed that he would never go back again. But circumstances led him to rob and steal again. Mike, Mike and his girlfriend several times were homeless in, in Chicago. They had nothing. Mike would panhandle or, or rob or steal what they needed in order to eat. 2013, things really got out of control when his former girlfriend turned him in, Mike in, because he couldn't pay child support. And Mike went to jail and he also lost his driver's license. I mean, to me, that doesn't make much sense. That, you know, if you don't pay your child support, what they do is they revoke your driver's license. But this time, Mike had a turning point in prison. He wanted to make things right with his former girlfriends and try to establish a relationship with his daughters and get caught up on child support. He set some goals up for himself. And it was really difficult for him having a record, no license or a vehicle to get to work. So he took some jobs, some part-time jobs just to support himself. But after a short time, he was let go because he couldn't get a ride to work. So he started working at Miss Carly's. And actually Miss Carly paid him a little money because he ran uh, part of the operation there. So she would pay him money. And I got in a conversation with him and I says, you know, Mike, what, what do you really want out of life? And he says, I'd like to get my license back so I can go see my daughters. And I said, we can do that. So Mike, you know, me and Mike, one day we went out to the driver's license bureau. And I, what I didn't know is after you get the driver's license revoked, you have to do the test drive. So... Off Mike goes with, my, with the driving person, right, in my car. Love is patient. Jeff is patient. Jeff is kind. 
Mike came back, his face was beaming, and that's Mike holding up his driver's license that he hadn't had for six years. Jeff is patient. Jeff is kind. Mike now has a full-time job. He has custody of both his kids. They live um, in an apartment in Rockford. His kids are actually going to Rock Valley College now. By just somebody taking the time to listen to God's word. James 1, verse 22 to 25 says this, You must be doers of the word. And not only hearers that mislead themselves, those who hear but do not do the word are like those who look at their faces in a mirror. To me, that verse convicted me. All I did was read that piece of scripture and then that reflected on that other one, 1 Corinthians, Jeff is patient, Jeff is kind, Jeff isn't jealous. Jeff doesn't brag, Jeff isn't arrogant, isn't rude, it doesn't seek his own advantage, Jeff isn't irritable, doesn't keep a record of complaints, Jeff isn't happy with injustice, but Jeff is happy with the truth. Jeff puts up with all things, trust in all things, hopes for all things, and endures all things. See, scripture has changed me. It has shown me God's love in a powerful way. See, our walk with Christ is a personal journey. It's our responsibility of our growth in faith. And sometimes we do it with others, but mostly we do it for ourselves. After all, who is with you the most besides God? You are. So read your Bible. Read, you know, I find ways that God inspires me to give you hope when you feel hopeless sometimes. Meditate on it. What may God be calling me to do? How might I live my life or out in my life? How does it challenge me? How does it call me to be a better person, a better partner, a better friend? Maybe a better parent. Then share it with others. Share your life with them. Invite them to help you know what are the places I need to grow in my own life. How can I support you, encourage you, and help you? And like Jesus, when times get challenging, hold on to a piece of scripture The study of scripture inspires us, transforms us, and even changes us. And I believe with my whole heart and being that our lives will all be the better for it. Would you pray with me? God, teach us to listen. Help us to pay attention to the ways you are revealed to us in the world around us. In our everyday life. But also, God, help us to read and to study your word, the scriptures, finding in them the words of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.